And so good of you to join us. Um, I just mentioned after the keynote of Ms. Bell that uh, this talk would be hosted by Jeska Engelbert of the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. But she unfortunately is stranded in a train station uh, near Rotterdam, so she couldn't make it to the studio, so, so unfortunate. But uh, we're very happy to have here um, Joelle Swart, sorry, of the uh, Rijksuniversiteit Groningen, um, who has, alongside Jiska Engelbert, been researching digital inclusion and how we can make the digital world more inclusive through the use of the library, the public library. And Shirley De Witt of VHTO, who has been looking at the role of women in the digital world or the lack thereof and stereotypes surrounding them uh, held. For, specifically by children um, and again this this goes the same you know the drill I hope um, if you have any question or comment or anything leave it in the chat box I can see it popping up and uh, we can put it into the conversation here just to make it a little bit more interactive um, uh, than it is perhaps now I'm going to start with uh, with you, Joelle, if, if that's okay with you. What exactly did you did you um, did you do in your research? So we started our research from the premise that um, we increasingly need digital skills to be able to participate in society, whether it's at work or to arrange things with the government um, or even socially uh, to catch up with friends. Um, being able to deal with ICT is is more and more important. Um, and on the other hand, we also see that a lot of people in the Netherlands still also lack this kind of digital literacy. Um, and libraries play an important role in fostering these kind of digital skills um, because they also reach people who are already outside of the scope of formal education, um, but still uh, lack digital literacy. And we're talking about a group of two and a half million people here. So it's really a large um, group of people who st are struggling with the increasing digitalization of society. So what we did was um, go to these libraries, uh, do participant observations and do interviews with um, people who were visiting um, the digital help that the library offers there, so mm -hmm. courses, walk-in hours, um, the special uh, information desks that the uh, public libraries now have. Mm -hmm. um, and so we talk to people um, to find out what they expect from this kind of digital help and digital support in these libraries, um, but also what are the barriers um, for them to develop digital literacy. Yeah. And what did you think when you started out with this research? What did you, what did you assume? Uh, well, we, find. <laughs> we assumed that we would find that there indeed was a high demand for these kind of services, but we weren't really sure yet what kind of expectations people would have of this digital help. Um, and we also have quite a little insight in um, you know, what kind of barriers there are uh, for people to develop digital literacy. Mm. Um, so the focus um, uh, with the digitalizing government is increasingly put on citizens yeah. um, to increase their digital skills. So these individual responsibility, um, but is that actually uh, possible? And then what is necessary to make people digital literate? Um, yeah. that's, a, that's a major question. Yeah, because you, you talk about the barriers people experience into developing developing digital literacy, what kind of barriers sh should I think of? So, um, for instance, what we found was that for most people who are coming to these kind of centers or information desks, um, the main reason why they struggle to develop digital literacy is also fear, fear of the unknown, um, fear of um, um, doing something wrong. They're very, very uh, scared of pushing the wrong button, mm. for instance, and what kind of consequence that then has. Mm. Um, and you may think about it, it's also not so so strange. Think of the Tuschlage affair, mm. for instance, uh, dealing with the EVE government, a lot of things uh, can go wrong that also have very significant consequences mm -hmm. for people. So often these kind of questions um, that people uh, come to the library for, these are not just digital questions, but they're also questions about, um, you know, financial questions, yeah, legal questions, and so yeah. on. So yeah. these are often very complex issues. Yeah. Um, that the library provides uh, support for. Yeah, you mentioned two and a half million people who are yes. digitally, uh, digitally uh, literate. Um, that's a lot of people. And I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, policymakers and politicians saying, well, the Dutch are so digitally active and we have the highest internet uh, concentration of Europe, it'll all be fine. They didn't remember these two and a half people. No, million people, sorry. 
that's yeah. an assumption that's often made, yeah. right? That um, this also accounts for a digital natives argument. Young people will yeah. just themselves develop digital literacy um, and then the problem will be solved, uh, you know, after 30, 40 years um, um, and we don't need to do anything about it. But that's not true. Um, we find that people who are digitally illiterate, that's not just the elderly, that's not just vulnerable groups like low literate people, um, but it's a much, much broader population that is lacking digital skills. And also among young people, we see that this doesn't just solve itself. Um, but for instance, uh, children from families uh, that are low income, that have a low level of education, are also uh, more likely, if their parents are lowly uh, digitally literate, that it also accounts for their children. So it's also a process gets that very that gets passed on and that mimics social inequalities in society. Yeah, um, because I was going to well. ask, is there anything in general you can say about this group? Yeah, so that group, um, uh, digital illiteracy also mimics social inequality. Mm. So if we talk about digital divides, we're also talking about pre-existing social divides uh, between genders, um, ethnicities, um, income uh, groups, social class. So it's easy to think, well, if we solve, if we increase digital skills, then the issue is solved. Um, but yeah, it's a much broader issue that also has yeah. uh, much more different You sides. can't just tweak one little button and expect everything and else. And expect to be, everything to yeah. be okay if you can digitally participate. Yeah, I will get back to you on how exactly libraries try to to uh, at least change this. But first, uh, Mr. Witt, welcome. Um, now, you looked at the role of stereotyping with women in the digital world. But um, let's begin with the numbers. How many women are there in the field of computer sciences? Yeah, we are looking in the Netherlands and the technical roles. It's about 14%. Uh, 14. 14. 14, yes. Yeah, just for everybody thinking, she said 14. No, no. 14. <laughs> yes. 14 percent people. Yeah, OK. Um, and we see the same in education. It's all about 10 to 15 uh, percent um, are women and especially if you look at uh, the Dutch MBO mm -hmm. uh, it's even lower um, so yeah there's just a really big gender gap uh, in IT yeah it's not even a gap it's like a it's a, huge yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a cliff um, so you looked at one of the possible courses I guess would be yes. um, you study children's assumptions on what a computer scientist looks like. Well, what do children think? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we ask three specific things. So gender, um, interest, and also social. So our programmers uh, working alone or together. Yeah. Um, what we found is that they overall uh, think, um, yeah, we did it, we measured in two ways. So implicit and explicit with implicit meaning uh, that you're not per se conscious about what you're thinking and then explicit is if I ask you uh, a question and you answer that that you consciously think about it um, and for the gender we found for unconsciously actually no differences uh, but for consciously so that's when we ask them do you think a programmer is for boys or for girls mm -hmm. uh, they say it's more for boys um, and when we are asking about the work, uh, so working alone and together, uh, surprisingly, they uh, think that programmers are quite social. And we didn't expect that because we know that adults often think that they're not social. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the interest, we compared tennis and video games. Um, and they were really clear about that, that the programmer uh, prefers to play video games uh, and not the tennis per se. That's fascinating. And... Um... Why do you think that they, I mean, did you at, uh, at all um, write about why the children would think this? Um, yeah, we didn't specifically look at it uh, in this study, but of course we know from other studies uh, what's going on. And we know that there are lack of role models. So if you encounter someone who's working in a technical role, it's yeah, more likely that you're encountering men. Um, so that's one of the reasons uh, yeah, that they don't see and uh, or girls don't see other women in the field so yeah then they can't really imagine that they can uh, go into the technical fields uh, but it's of course oak media uh, if you look at news the pictures that are being used uh, commercials they are the worst uh, <laughs> when it comes to stereotypes uh, but also just movies and and even cartoons for kids um, yeah, just show a lot of stereotypes in them. Yeah, Miss Bell just mentioned, didn't she, the stereotype of the of the lonely genius in a in a in a garage somewhere in Silicon Valley. Yes. Uh, whereas you know she 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 argued the opposite. Um, 
the other question you could wonder is, why, why, why does it matter? Why does it matter that there's only 14% of women? I mean, yeah, there there are a couple of reasons why, why it matters. First of all, we know that there are is going to be a lot of jobs in the IT field. Mm. Um, so we need a lot of people and now we're only using about half of the potential. Um, so that, that's one reason. The other is that um, we want women to be financial independent uh, and IT offers them a good job opportunity with good salaries. Yeah. Um, and the third reason is that we also think that um, software that's being developed will be um, yeah, better, so to say, if you have a diverse team. And that's both with innovation, we know that diverse teams have more innovation, um, but it's also the amount of per perspectives that you take into account, uh, especially if you look at how big the impact of, of IT is on all our lives, mm -hmm. then it's also important that everyone, or at least a representation of the society should also, yeah, um, work on those projects. Yeah, I once heard a female tech executive say, um, if there were more women in the field, we might have had better solutions to problems than making a taxi app. Even though that's quite handy, one could argue that there are bigger issues to be solved. Do you agree? Um, yes, and I think it's also, um, it's the variety of issues, but it's also within a certain uh, for instance, in the taxi app, you make certain decisions. Uh, and if you have already in the design phase, uh, multiple perspectives in your team, uh, then you can use that already. Of course, you can do user testing because that's, of course, the counter argument that we hear a lot. But user testing is only at certain points. You cannot do that all the time because it's really costly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, yeah, we would definitely have probably more diverse uh, tech if the people that make that they are also more, more diverse. diverse. Yeah, speaking of diversity, because your research uh, focused on the region in Groningen, uh, if I've understood correctly, and the research of Ms. Engelbert was in the city of Rotterdam. Now, what are the differences that you found in the regional uh, aspect? Yeah, so first I should add, we had a third location as well in, uh, in Limburg, ah. in the south. So we yeah. um, purchased the whole selected, country. Yeah. Um, well, multiple locations in the country, both yeah. bigger city, more rural area and uh, a mid-sized city in between, yeah. um, but also quite different populations. So um, for instance, we had one location where uh, there were a lot of migrants uh, visiting the, the library also yeah. to learn uh, Dutch. Um, and you can imagine that whenever you know the language, it's also much easier to use digital technology. Yeah. Um, we also um, had um, areas where, um, you know, with, with quite a different population with more ethnic diversity. Um, we had um, um, locations where there were more uh, low literate people, so people ha having um, uh, trouble reading and writing. So there were different groups um, also within these different locations. And that, of course, also then matters for, um, yeah, what promotes digital literacy, because as I, as I mentioned before, for um, these issues often are intertwined with other um, um, problems that people may have, with whether these may be financial or social, um, language problems, um, sometimes people with um, impairments. Mm -hmm. um, because you can imagine if you have uh, certain disabilities that it's also, of course, much more uh, problematic to use digital technologies. Yeah. And all these things intersect, which also makes it such a difficult problem with I don't think there's a, a one-size-fits-all solution. No, exactly, because yeah. you did your research, if I understood correctly, uh, focused in Groningen. Yeah. What, what did you specifically find there? Um, so in the province, um, we found uh, that there is a very large population um, that does, uh, or a relatively large population that has trouble uh, reading and writing. Uh, so for instance, that um, also affects um, their use of digital technology. What um, I think- What is fairly large? Well, I think within the, the east of uh, the province there, um, the literate uh, percentage is about 15%. Uh, so that's quite sizable if you compare yeah. it to other parts of, uh, of the Netherlands. Um, and um, one of the issues um, at the location was also to get people to come to the library, because you can imagine if you can't are not, read. if you can't read, why yeah. would you come to a library? I actually, so, I, I, I walked past my own library, which is also in, I, I, would, I would assume, a vulnerable part of the city that said, come in and learn about digit and 
I thought of yeah. your research and I thought, yeah, but if you can't read, you can't read the poster. So that's an issue, I, yeah. I assume. Yeah. So the threshold, how to reach people and to yeah. come to these libraries, um, they're doing an amazing job um, and they, they attract more and more people. Um, but what we see there, the people that are coming there are, of course, only the tip of the iceberg. If yeah. you know that there are two and a half million people uh, lacking these kind of skills, you would, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a much larger population that you can reach. And so libraries are part of that solution. Yeah. Uh, formal education can be part of that solution. But I think, yeah, it's, it's more like a collective responsibility uh, where also, for instance, companies could play a role. Um, yeah. in, in How could companies their... play a role in? Well, in two ways. Um, so if we talk about um, digital skills that people now need, employees need to be able to carry out their jobs, um, providing more support, um, lifelong learning, I think, for, for staff is one thing. Um, but also if we think about uh, IT companies and the type of systems that they design, um, try to make them inclusive, accessible uh, for a larger larger group. So we're talking about gender here. Yeah. Um, but of course, you can also think about people who have disabilities um, or who, um, if you have trouble um, reading and writing, well, maybe making things more visually um, uh, could also help. So. I guess the the, the, the uh, solution is also a twofold thing, not only looking at the user, but also looking at how we can design these systems in a more inclusive manner. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because two, I think two weeks ago, I tried to schedule a corona test at the GGD and I had to answer, I think about 20 questions before I got to the screen that asked me for my postal code. And then I did that and then it said, there is no option. Um, and obviously that's frustrating, but I am digitally uh, literate. You know, I can read it. And I thought if you have to have 20 steps before to get to the end and then the end says, well, sorry. I mean, are, are people who design these uh, digital rooms, are they at, least, uh, at all aware of, of, of the two and a half million people that I can't? They're increasingly aware, but I think there's indeed still a world to win there. Yeah. Um, so awareness, but also I think understanding and having, if you test these systems, have a have a diverse user group um, instead of, uh, you know, the, probably I can imagine this this might also be um, not so diverse, the, the people that they test these systems with. Yeah. I think it's incredibly important that you try to make that as diverse as possible. Also to account for, for the many situations that people can use a, a system in, so not just the different devices and the screen sizes, but also taking into account, well, the, the end users that use these kind of systems. Yeah. Is it, because you mentioned uh, many of these users are, you know, they, they can't read and write, is it? Um, like, what's the answer? Is it making the digital world more susceptible to them or to raise them to a level that they can at least use the digital world? Yeah, yeah. Both, both, I would say. Yeah. So I think um, uh, there is a large part to play in educating uh, people and fostering digital literacy um, in non-formal communication, yeah. um, but also, um, or education, as you'd say, um, but also on the other hand, trying to design these systems in more inclusive manners. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it needs to come from both sides. At the same time, uh, the basic question that, that goes underneath of all this is that we need um computers to solve a problem mm -hmm. in this case is that for certain parts of our population is is a computer always the best solution um that's a good question um because well we see that services are increasingly being digitized mm -hmm. and sometimes there's no alternative anymore for people who well either don't have access to these uh, these technologies or maybe have good reasons why they wouldn't want to um, use them privacy uh, issues for instance um and you could yeah you could question whether all whether the digital is always the best solution for everyone. Um, and I think what also sometimes is lacking is communicating why, in this case, what, what is in it for the citizen mm. to make these services digital. So what are the benefits? Um, because of course, for, for companies and governments, it's easy when everyone can um, arrange things online and it's a, it's a cost benefit mm. um, and it may also be an efficiency benefit. But I think what also uh, could be improved is communicating to people themselves why this 
is actually helpful or beneficial for Why them. you should go through the 20 steps yes. of the GGD before you can, yeah. Yes, instead of making a phone call yeah. where you get yeah. someone from the speak customer to a service, person. Uh, speak a person who probably has more eye for your personal context, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and can tell you, well, maybe there's not uh, no test available um, test facilities nearby, but, you know, five kilometers uh, yeah. uh, from your house, maybe there is an option. Yeah, it, it offers a bit more flexibility, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, Mr. Witt, um, you're talking, I mean, we're talking to, we're, we were talking about, a, well, a, a large, but still a, a minority in, in the bigger sense. Women are not a minority, I hope. I think we're the most of us uh, in the world. And um, so what, what should be done to make them fit better into the digital world? I think some of the solutions you mentioned also apply um, yeah. for the gender problem. Yes, for instance, the education. Um, at this point in the Netherlands, you go to the primary school and then there's, yeah, if you're lucky, your school offers some uh, digital school parts. Uh, but if you're unlucky, then you just don't have digital literacy within uh, your school. And the same goes for secondary education that some children just don't really work with computers that often, but also talk about what are the dangerous parts um, mm. of the systems. Um, so definitely a part in the education. Um, and of course, this is, those problems are so complex. So there's also not like, oh, education should fix it all. Mm. Education is just a part of the uh, entire solution. So it's also that parents, for instance, um, they are not always aware of what the options are uh, of working in IT uh, and therefore are not stimulating their daughters to go to a code event or to go to an open day and, and see what it actually entitles. Um, so yeah, there are just a lot of factors uh, in schools, in, in private environment, and of course also the companies. Um, there are still companies where, um, yeah, if you come in, it's not always as inclusive as you hope uh, it will be. So even if a girl decides after high school to study, uh, for instance, computer science, and then they start working, a lot of women also stop working in IT after one, two, three years. Mm. Um, Why so, is that? Um, because they don't feel like they belong in that environment. Yeah. Um, so we also, because those women are interested in the topic, otherwise they wouldn't choose those or study uh, choices. Um, so we also have a lot of work to do, like in the yeah, in the companies, to make sure that when women come in, um, yeah, they are also preserved and and yeah, stay in tech. Yep. Um, and with this, it's also like there's this threshold of thirty percent. Mm -hmm. If you you start meeting that percentage, uh, the culture will also change, and you will no longer be the minority. Yeah. Uh, because now, if you make a mistake in a company, it's that woman it's the woman who makes the mistake yes exactly yeah, yeah. um or thinking of elizabeth holmes the, the token woman who made the mistake yeah. um yeah because it's it's uh, i wanted to um get back on that there's actually time magazine has a cover i think this week of uh the facebook whistleblower and um what does it tell you that a facebook whistleblower is a woman does it say anything um yeah, that for specific cases, of course, hard to say why someone is motivated uh, to take a certain sure. action. Um, but yeah, of course, it is how m more diverse your team is, mm. the more diverse opinions and ethical uh, parts you can take into your software uh, as a company. Uh, so yeah, in a way, I'm not surprised, but um, yeah. I find it, I don't know the case exactly, so yeah. I can't really. I remember some research. Uh, I used to work in the in the prehistoric ages. I used to work for the feminist magazine Opsai. I remember that there's some research indicated that when women speak out, it's because of values in a company, and that when they start to speak out, that there's something wrong in the company with the values. Yeah, yeah. And to what extent um, is this issue? Because you 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 focus on computer science, but isn't it broader? when it comes to like the whole better field, like yeah. maths and, uh, you know. Uh... That's definitely true. So in my uh, work as a PhD student at Leiden University, I really focus on computer science. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at my work at VHDO, we look at all the STEM fields. Uh, so it's beta, technik and IT. Um, and we do see like IT is becoming a really big sector and therefore it's 
yeah, really important to also focus on that part. But of course, we still have, for instance, um, in the uh, construction. Um, and I, I recently drove by an ad and it was um, uh, Dac Capel. I don't know mm -hmm. what's in English, but it said like, no, uh, do, you want, <laughs> do you want to fulfill your boy's dream? Ah. That was literally the, the text they had yeah. uh, come work with us. And then you think like, yeah here is one of the issues uh, why we're still in this situation. Yeah, and I ask that because when you look at it from a broader perspective, um, you will people know this, that in China, uh, there isn't such a big gap between yeah. boys and girls. So what could we learn from other countries when it comes to ha tackling this? Um, well, actually, it is the, the countries who are more like gender equal mm -hmm. have bigger gaps in tech. Um, and that's partially because um, how we motivate our children to make certain decisions. Yeah, It's really like you can do what you like because you have a really good opportunity in a lot of uh, sectors. Well, in other countries, they say more like it should be a safe job. And they think, okay, sitting behind the computer inside is safe. Yeah. Um, but that's not something we, sh we are really worrying about uh, when making those decisions. So I think it's a part like the luxury we have mm -hmm. uh, to pick whatever you want um, yeah, also enforces uh, yeah, that gap. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've been talking uh, about a research and a research agenda. And um, uh, Joelle, what responsibility do you think researchers have themselves when they ask the questions that they're going to find in their research? Is should they ask different questions, perhaps? Um, different questions in what sense do you mean? Well, as you mentioned that um, sometimes a computer is not always the answer, um, then maybe you should ask a question of how can we reach them rather than how can we reach them through a computer? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think what is most important there is to really depart from the circumstances of people's everyday lives. So yeah. not so much um, pre-assuming a certain need, but really looking at how um, does digital technology or would technology enhance their lives? What kind of opportunities might it offer them or what kind of risks might it protect them from? Yeah. Um, rather than simply assuming that technology is always the answer or yeah. um, uh, for any problem that they might have. Um, because I think what digital literacy is is not just for me a, not a package of knowledge and skills that you should have, but also um, being able to use and implement in, uh, these kind of skills and knowledge um, in situations that for you it will be beneficial. So it advances you, it helps you to um, uh, socially connect, to, to perform better at work or um, do something else that really advances your life. So it's for me more about the impact that these kind of skills have yeah. rather than um, increasing people's skills per se because yeah. maybe you don't need the same as the other person in a different job or different situation needs. Yeah. Um, so I think it's also important to look at digital literacy contextually. And yeah. I think these kind of questions, the more fundamental questions of what then does it mean to be digital literate for yeah. everyone is really important to, uh, to ask as researchers. Yeah. I just want to repeat for everybody who's listening, if you have a question, please put it in the chat box because we have some time left. So there's uh, plenty of time to answer any questions and uh, just make sure that if you do have anything, let us know. Um, so yeah, um, you were talking about fundamental uh, questions in research. I was wondering when you started out, is there any thing that you found that really surprised you? Um... I think most surprising uh, for me, and well, this was partially due to uh, the fact that we did our research in the corona crisis. Oh, yes, of course. Um, but what I found quite worrying um, is that, of course, um, we did our research in September to November 2020, so really after the first, um, first wave. And so, of course, the groups that came to the libraries weren't always the most vulnerable groups um, who were uh, most probably would also most benefit from yeah. uh, this kind of support. 
Um, so what surprised me in a sense, and that was a bit of a, you could say a negative uh, turnout, um, was how difficult it is also for libraries who are so very much ingrained within these uh, communities in these neighborhoods still to reach these people. And I think that's a major issue um, uh, for increasing digital inclusion. Yeah, uh, so that, that goes, was, yeah, yeah, that goes even far beyond your own research. Far beyond perhaps. your own research, uh, yeah. 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 Um, that goes for you. Same question. Was there anything that really surprised you that you hadn't anticipated? Um, yeah, of course, the, the working together and the social part was in the research itself surprising. Yeah. And sometimes you know things, but if you then see a seven year old girl standing in front of you and saying, well, I don't think programming is something for me and it's for boys. Yeah. You know, that's the case, but it is still some confronting to see such young children already knowing like it's not for me. Um, and I would also like to add to the previous question about the, um, um, what researchers can do yeah. uh, on their gender part is be really aware of your own biases. Um, so everyone has them and it's, it's the first step is to know which biases you have mm. um, because society forms in a certain way. So sometimes you can't even like help that you have them and it's not like you want to do bad. We also say to teachers that we talk to like it's not that we say oh you don't want the girls to have this opportunity it's just you have certain bias and unconsciously you behave differently to boys and girls uh, so I think that's really a first step as researcher to be really aware of what is my what are my assumptions what are your own what, assumptions yeah. yeah and what are your biases and take that into account um, you yeah, when analyzing the data or doing an interview or what are, yeah. what, are what were your biases did you have any biases um, I have them sometimes like the other way around, right? Uh, because I'm so focused on on girls and tech that sometimes I see, uh, for instance, in a commercial or anywhere else, a boy doing something with tech, and then my first thing is, why isn't that a girl? <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's kind of working the other way around because yeah. you're so focused on on the stereotypes that you see, yeah. Um, and it's also like. For instance, when a girl is playing with dolls because toys have a big impact, it's not bad that she's playing with dolls if she also has the opportunity mm. to, for instance, play with, with cars. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not per se bad if people yeah, prefer stereotypical things as long as they have also seen the other options yeah. out there. I, I do recognize this as a mom of two girls um, when they're wearing princess dresses, you're checking, no! Not the princess dress, <laughs> but then again, they're having fun with it. So yeah, I, yeah. I recognize this bias. We have two questions um, um, from Brecht Alumnus. And she, the first one is uh, for you, Joelle, she's a uh, very interesting research. Is there a follow-up plan? Not yet, um, but um, I'm happy to send along uh, the uh, uh, results or the re final report for the first pilot that we did. And we really hope that there will be um, an extension. Yeah. We are in Groningen um, doing two follow-up projects or projects around digital inclusion and digital literacy, mm. where we focus um, also on vulnerable um, adults and yeah. specifically the low literate group, which is only like a target group, mm -hmm. um, small tar um, target group. Um, but so there is some follow up in that sense. Yeah. Um, and we also hope to uh, um, well build upon this pilot in, uh, in subsequent projects for other uh, target groups in the future. Sounds fascinating. Um, there was also a question for you. Um, and Brecht says, to my experience, these coding events organized for primary schools are often really quickly full. Would it be an idea to organize such workshops for girls only? Oh, we actually do organize these, just for the girls. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, but not um, as often as we would like to. Um, so those they exist. Those go events only for girls. And we, for instance, this summer uh, had a summer camp with only girls, three days of coding, and and that was it's really good for the girls to to um, really practice their skills and yeah. gain confidence that they are also able to do so. Yeah. Um, it is also a bit of a risk doing those code events out of school, as in there will be a certain population that will send their kids to those code events. Yeah. Um, so it is also about how can we make sure that all kids uh, get the opportunity to learn and to, to experience, uh, for instance, coding. Uh, instead of only the ones with parents who think it's important. It's important, yeah, yeah. because there's a bias there as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a question from Tarleton Gillespie, uh, who's uh, also in our midst, and he says, is there a political will in the Netherlands or in Europe for a substantive digital literacy push? 
What do you think is the most convincing political argument for funding such efforts, Joelle? Um, well, for me, it would be simply about inclusion and participation. And I think digital literacy is increasing prerequisite um, for that. Yeah. And so um, what I would very much encourage, um, there is already uh, the Ministry for Interior is already funding projects uh, such as the one in the libraries to foster digital inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there would be much more that could be done uh, to foster digital inclusion, to really make policy, to think about um, if you if you set up these services, even as a government yourself, um, to take into account this digital literacy part, how are people going to use it? How are we mm. going to make sure um, that people are all also able to use these uh, these kind of systems and our digital technology is always the best solution yeah. in this case? Exactly. Well, th there's another part of that question and it says, is there a political will in the Netherlands. I mean, that's um, for all research, I guess, is, is the most frustrating step is how to see it evolve or at least see it evolve into policy. Yeah. Is that political will, do you think? Um, partially, yes, and increasingly, but um, I think it also starts with awareness. Um, so awareness that this is a much larger issue than just the elderly, just the low literate, just the vulnerable people, but it's really a massive group of people who are uh, struggling to participate in this digital society. So I think it starts from there, a better understanding, more structural understanding, fundamental understanding of um, which groups in society this affects, and then more tailored policy to these different groups. Um, I think those are the three steps that need to be taken. And of course, that requires political will as well. Yeah. Um, and do you think COVID has really confronted us with, well, the issues surrounding this? I mean, if we look at the debate on how it, uh, who, uh, the people who, who are unvaccinated, regardless of where you stand there, the people who are unvaccinated largely are people who are either completely illiterate or digitally illiterate. So do you think that there is more political will now than before? Um, I think what COVID mostly has done is really shown us how vital it is to be able to use digital technologies. Um, think about education, for instance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everything was online. We taught yeah. our classes online. Uh, so what if you don't have access to this technology or what do you, if you need to share a tablet uh, with your three siblings in a small room and the parent needs to work at the same time, right? Yeah. Um, so it's also about these kind of questions and it's really important to think that we uh, we pay attention to that and I think, um, so on the one hand, this has shown uh, as how important and vital it is to increase the chillers to see here and to increase access. Um, yeah, on the other hand, it's also shown how large the issue still is and how yeah. many people still lack access. Still struggle, yeah. Struggle. Um, surely there's a question from Sally and she says, historically, there were many more women in computer science um, above the 30% you mentioned. Uh, from the mid 1980s, it started to decline. And why do you think that was? Yeah, the, the, um, that, that's completely true. Um, it has to do with the development of technology, it becoming more and more important. Uh, and at first it was not that important and not important means women can do that work. Um, but then um, when there so was when we didn't think it was important, it was good enough for a woman yeah. to do. And then when it's starting to get important, we thought, oh, well, then the men should. Yeah, you, it, it's now good pay and, and it's, it's kind of status to really yeah. be able to work with computers. And to add to that, it's also the coming of the personal computer. So the PC was also really advertised. Uh, for men, like you can buy this at home, so you have the status, yeah. uh, status, and um, then you can play games with your son. Mm -hmm. That's not completely what what all the advertisements uh, did, but that was like the the broader uh, yeah message. Yeah, and if we go back to the keynote of um, uh, Genevieve Bell, she mentioned how the women were replaced by the machines. Uh, was that one of the other reasons that women, you know, disappeared from the from the field? Um, well, the, the work uh, developed, mm. so the, the the sort of work, but like really the programmers per se um, weren't replaced by machines only, were also just uh, replaced by men. Okay, I see. And and just to get back to the question of uh, Charlton Gillespie, who mentioned, is there political will that went, uh, that was about digital literacy, but that goes for women in uh, computer science as well. Is there any uh, political will on a national level? Because I know there is on a European level, but on a national level, do you find that there is political will? There is, like, there are not a lot of people denying that it is important uh, yeah. to close the gender gap. 
uh, but then actually doing something uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, of uh, for instance, saying that uh, digital literacy should be in education or that uh, there needs to be more, more funding. Um, there's actually being less and less funding uh, mm -hmm. for the projects, at least that VHGO do from the government. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there is will, but then the, there needs also needs to be action. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is there any role that companies can play here as well? Um, I mean, yeah, they have an interest for themselves. Yeah, they need definitely. Programming. And, and yeah. some of them do. Some of them really take a lot of time and effort to win in their company um, to improve, but also fund uh, to make sure that the funeral, uh, that there are more girls interested in tech. And that can be by participating in, for instance, like uh, we have a big event, Girls Day, where uh, before Corona, uh, <laughs> 10,000 girls participated and a lot of companies. And yeah. all those companies invite those girls in their company to show what it is to work in tech. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there are definitely companies willing and, and also yeah, doing something uh, about this problem. Yeah, I'm just gonna uh, repeat, I think for the last time, because we're gonna have a short break in a few minutes uh, for the next session. If you have a question, ah, there is a question by Catherine. What about intergenerational learning? I, person I personally think that there is a great opportunity to connect the elders and the youth to train digital literacy. What do you think, Joelle? Um, I think this uh, is indeed an opportunity. I think we should be cautious, though, not to place the responsibility on children and grandchildren to increase the digital literacy of their parents and mm. grandparents. Yeah. Um, also, because we know from research that not all uh, young people are actually digitally literate. Yeah. Um, so maybe what we see, for instance, is that ICT skills, so being able to navigate technologies, operate, operate them, um, that is something that children can pretty easily learn. Yeah. Um, but for for instance, um, thinking more critically about information, so more media literacy kind of skills, um, um, those aren't always as present in young people as is often assumed. So this, I think this could indeed be a learning uh, opportunity and you also see this happening. So many of these two and a half million people, they don't seek external help, but they try to solve whatever problems they find when using digital technologies within their families or yeah. maybe with a friend or a neighbor. Um, so this in, informal source of help is is very important. Um, but I think at the same time, I wouldn't only look at intergenerational learning here um, and learning within families because, well, there might be an issue there as well. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Sally Wyatt. Um, she asks, are there any implications, are there, sorry, are there implications of Shirley and Joelle's research about how we should teach digital skills at different levels to different groups, more interdisciplinary, more attention to social issues? What do you think, Shirley? Um, yeah, definitely. It's the case of from the research itself, for instance, that children think, um, programmers play video games mm -hmm. can also relate to the fact that we often use video games uh, as a programming exercise in yes. schools. Yeah. Uh, so there are definitely things that we can improve in the exercises, but also the images, the examples that we use, uh, for instance, building a robot or maybe building a robot that is doing something in uh, an hospital. So mm -hmm. putting it into a context can really help more children to really understand and think, oh, maybe it is something for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, um, sorry, can you repeat that? Are there <laughs> implications of your research about how we should teach the skills? Yeah. So it's really about like the, the lesson materials, yeah. also the teachers with the biases, yeah. uh, make sure that they don't have them or at least know how to uh, handle them if they have the bias. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And, and it's also really showing that um, it is sometimes such in, in details, like if I'm in a classroom and I let the girls uh, work on their laptops, you can decide to let them work on their own mm -hmm. or work in pairs. Yeah. Um, and it's such a small change that you can actually make to already say like show that it's also a social profession yeah um and you can also because i know from educational perspective a lot of people say like another subject that comes on, on top of everything we already have to do yeah um but you can also think about uh, for instance doing a an uh math lesson and using scratch yeah uh, to make a calculator for instance yeah so you can really also 
see where you can use technology um, yeah, in your other learning goals. Yeah. How does that go for your uh, research? How, yeah. is, is there anything you can say on to how? On the how, I, well, I, I would first like to, if I can follow up on that yeah, point, sure. I think it's really important indeed to integrate it within education. So for instance, if you teach languages, then uh, media literacy skills and critically assessing information can easily be paired to that. If you talk about maths, for instance, uh, you could compare that or like link it up to computer computational thinking. So there's different um, elements where, and I think this is also important because digital, the digital is integrated in everything. Mm, so it's yeah. also, I think, possible to um, to make that step for every uh, every course. Um, yeah, what I would like to add from our research is that I think trust is really vital here um, as well. So um, it's not just about um, having the knowledge and skills, but also trusting digital technology, trusting yeah. yourself, having the confidence that you are able to do uh, certain things. That is something that came up for actually all the groups um, and all the people that we uh, we studied. So it's really important to have a safe space where you can practice yeah. uh, with technology. Um, it also helped when there was um, uh, staff member um, that was always there every uh, yeah. um, every week that they would come in. Um, so you build a more long lasting relationship. So these kind of things help. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's one of the most important. Uh, yeah, I can also imagine it how... helps that there is a library because they, they quite suffered from the last financial crisis. Uh, I mean, there's been yeah. quite uh, uh, extensive uh, cutbacks on the on the library system. Did that play a role as well? Do you that think? is an important issue. Yes, yeah. um, because we know that uh, only well only a small proportion of people go to the library, and it's bound to be increasing uh, um, because we know that there are a lot of people who are lacking digital skills. Yeah. So um, there is an increasing role for libraries, and what we see is that there is an increasing shift from tasks from the government to these libraries, yeah. right? So the yeah. these governments, uh, government agencies, they develop these uh, digital system. People are increasingly required to use the digital systems. Um, and they they have um, now also opened up since 2019, several information desks, digital government or e-government, where people can go with questions. So libraries increasingly get this role. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's also important then to um, provide adequate funding for that. For because those libraries, yeah. For those libraries. Um, um, and uh, because it, it does require quite something for the staff as well. It's not only having digital skills, but also knowing um, about all changing leg legislations around all these benefits, rent benefits, uh, unemployment benefits, and so on. Um, so it's quite a bit of knowledge that you need for this. And um, so it's not only the, the technological developments that you need to keep up with, but also all these legal financial changes um, in legislation. Yeah, um, that so we expect people who work in a library to know like, of. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. Which is quite a different role from, you know, what some people were trained for initially. Yeah. So there's... Um, Knowing what books to read. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, I, uh, I, I completely understand. Um, I think this is all for this panel. Um, where, but don't leave. Well, you can leave the panel, but um, thank you so much for watching, and thank you so much for the great questions that you put in our, in the chat box. Uh, we will be back uh, with uh, the last part of the program, which is the science call, um, with Emil Arts and uh, Mieke van der Berg, and of course, Sally Wyatt, which will revolve around new research initiatives and why you should send them in. Um, well, perhaps because you can find out the, the, the fascinating stuff that we've just been talking about. Um, so you'll find that when you go back to the lobby, you return to the lobby and uh, you can click on the program and it will start at three o'clock and you'll see me here in the studio with different guests. But for now, thank you so much and have a short break, but don't forget to return to us. Okay, see you in a bit. <laughs>